are live. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of the Advocacy Update podcast. My name is Clark Rockfall, the Director of Advocacy and Governmental Affairs for the American Council of the Blind. And not only will this be an audio podcast, but we are live and in Technicolor streaming. Geez, Kelly, where are we streaming? Uh, we are streaming on ACB Radio and we are streaming video to YouTube, Facebook, and the ACB community. So today we have a special episode. Here we are in 2021. We are counting down the days to the deadline for the ACB scholarships. And I'm joined today by our scholarship chair, or chair of the ACB scholarship committee, Rebecca Bridges. How are you? I am doing well, Clark. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And Rebecca, it's it's crunch time for you and the committee, right? Deadline is February 15th. Yes, the real work begins after that date. Right now it's crunch time for our applicants. But yes, we're very, very excited to, uh, to get everyone's applications and uh, get to work. That is awesome. And Rebecca, tell us a little bit about the ACB scholarships and I guess Let's start uh, personally because way, not way back when, um, just, just <laughs> yesterday, you were an ACB scholarship winner, correct? I was back in the dark ages. No, just kidding. Um, back in 2003, uh, the ACB conference and convention was, in, was to be held in Pittsburgh that year. And I was the recipient of a scholarship and um, I always tell everyone that uh, I, I, you know, that was my first convention, so I had an opportunity to to attend as a winner um, and to network, and it was such an amazing experience. I made so many new friends and jumped in with both feet, got involved in lots of different uh, aspects of ACB, uh, beginning with with ACB students and. Um, so Pittsburgh was my first convention as a scholarship winner, and they haven't been able, ACB hasn't been able to get rid of me since. There you go. And geez, not only were you a scholarship winner, but here you are, like you said, we haven't been able to get rid of you. You're still involved with ACB. I believe you are an ACB intern as well. Um, yes. And ACB is just in your family's blood, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It is a, a family affair. Um, and we love it. So yeah, I was that coincidentally, I was an intern that summer as well. So I sort of, I guess, had two roles at the convention was to, I was an intern, I was also a scholarship winner. I forget which thing happened first, um, in terms of me being notified. But, um, but yeah, that was, it was a great experience to be um, you know, to spend a summer in the national office back in 2003 and get to know all the inner workings plus uh, be a, you know, be a participant in the scholarship program and to meet lots of amazing peers with amazing stories and, you know, working on, you know, their academic pursuits and it was, it was great. And Rebecca, the scholarship application is currently open. Uh, yes. Folks can visit acb.org slash scholarships to register and find out more information and complete the application. Uh, what is your role as scholarship committee chair? You know, you, you said that the real work's about to begin. Yes. Well, um, after the, so one thing I just want to step back and say about the application um, for anyone who may still be on the fence about whether to apply or some, or maybe you're in the process of doing so. Um, everything is completely online. Um, in order to complete an application, you'll create an account. Um, once you go to acb.org slash scholarships or you'll sign in with your account. And the reason we ask you to create or you know, to use an account uh, before, to have an account before you create an application is so that it will save your information. So you can, you know, start the application, go in, look through it, you know, save some data in the required fields and, you know, look at the questions. Maybe you want to think about how you might answer some of them, because we do have some that ask for some narrative responses. So not just, 
you know, general demographic information, we, or information about your academic studies. We do have a few questions where we ask about your involvement in advocacy efforts, extracurricular activities, volunteerism, um, and any barriers and challenges to your academic pursuits, uh, your educational pursuits. So it's, uh, you know, but it's, it is fully online. It is completely accessible. Uh, very should be pretty easy to complete. Uh, you can come back, save your work, come back to it at any time. Um, regarding the work of the chair, so the first of all, nothing would be possible. What I do would not be possible without a few, you know, couple groups of people. One is the staff in Minneapolis. So the Nancys um, are amazing, and they are the first line of defense. So. They are the ones that receive um, the applications. Um, and then the next, in terms of what happens next. So um, I will work with the Minneapolis office to, we, um, the way we sort of go through this is it's, uh, the scholarship committee itself is organized into subcommittees. So we have anywhere from 15 to 20 scholarships that we offer annually. And so, each subcommittee has responsibility for um, a specific set of those scholarships or a subset of those scholarships. So we've divided them into subcommittees. So the first thing I have to do is go through all of the applications and based on uh, the eligibility requirements for each of the scholarships, we place all of the applicants into the various subcommittees. So that's, that's the first big undertaking. So I will touch every single completed application that shows up in the system. Um, and I will assist, I'll work with Nancy uh, Pila and, and, and Nancy Becker to get them into the right subcommittees. Um, one thing I'll say about our program is we do have very specific eligibility requirements for the scholarships. But the great thing is as an applicant, you're not applying by, you know, I'm applying for the, you know, for this specific one, you throw your, you know, your information in, and you could be eligible for multiple scholarships, you'll only win one, but you have multiple opportunities to win, let's put it that way. So the, so, the individual so, applicant doesn't need to be concerned with which specific yeah. scholarship they're applying for, the Correct. scholarship committee and subcommittees will will make sure that they are considered for uh, the all the scholarships that they may, might be eligible for. That you, Yes, you said it much better than I did. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> so, so essentially, so once, um, once everybody has been, all the applicants have been placed into their uh, respective subcommittees, and again, because you may be eligible for multiple scholarships, your name might appear in multiple, your application might appear in multiple subcommittees. Uh, for example, if you are a, uh, an accounting ma major, but you're also going to school uh, part-time and working full-time, you know, those scholarships are in different subcommittees. So, because we do have a scholarship for uh, students who are also working full-time and going to school part-time. So, uh, once that work is done, our, so the second group of people that I rely on heavily are the scholarship committee members. And we have an amazing group of, of talented and dedicated volunteers. Everybody is a volunteer in this committee. Uh, and they will go through, uh, their subcommittees will go through and score uh, the applications based on a, a set of criteria that we have. It's very you know, we have tried to, we make the process as clear and objective as, as we can um, based on, you know, the information in each of the applications and the eligibility requirements of the scholarships. So once that scoring is complete, they will submit, uh, each committee member will submit their scores and they'll roll up to each of the subcommittees have a chairperson. So that individual will then uh, take the lead in the next step, which is to schedule interviews. Um, so there are really a couple parts. If you're an applicant, there are two parts to the process. You submit an application, and then if you, uh, you know, once you're once we score the applications, 
in many cases, you'll be uh, contacted with a request for an interview. So um, because even though one thing that's new in the last couple of years, so last year and this year, we used to, so as I mentioned before, you may be eligible for multiple scholarships that might span across subcommittees. Um, and so you may have been contacted multiple times for interviews in the past. Um, now we've streamlined that process. So there's one interview per applicant, which is great because you know that way you don't get confused. Well, I'm calling from the ACB Scholarship Committee. Well, wait, I just heard from Rebecca on the Scholarship Committee. Didn't I just talk to you? Uh, so we're only doing this once now to really save all of you, the applicants, and really streamline the process. So save you a little bit of time. So the various you know, subcommittees will collaborate and will conduct interviews. And these interviews are about 30 minutes or so long. And they're, they really give us a chance to uh, get to know uh, all of you better. Um, you know, some people present really well in writing. Some people prefer the, you know, to speak to someone. So this is another opportunity for you um, as applicants to showcase, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and let us know who you are and what your goals are and for us to get to know you. Um, and it also provides opportunities for you to ask questions. So if you have questions about ACB or about the upcoming conference and convention and what, what you can expect, that's a great time to have those conversations. So once the interviews are done, uh, they based on the original scores of the applications themselves and then we go through and then based on the interviews, uh, we, you know, the selections are made and our uh, winner, our recipients are notified that they've been selected for a scholarship. And Rebecca, there's, a, there's well over 10 different scholarships that individuals might be eligible for, right? Whether they're studying general studies, music, uh, computer science, business engineering, uh, it's, it's quite the spectrum of different subject matters as well as geographical locations that individuals might be eligible for uh, from the ACB scholarships. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, so, you know, whether you live, you know, maybe, so some, some scholarships are based on what state you live in because the you know, the donors have, you know, specific requirements like, okay, we want them to be a Pennsylvania resident, for example. Um, others are, if you're a music major, if you're a social work major, if you're in education or rehabilitation, or if you are, you know, in business, accounting, uh, engineering, we've had, you know, IT, whatever, there is probably a scholarship for you. So certainly throw your hat in the ring. Um, you know, we do look for uh, a minimum of a 3.0 a grade point average. Uh, so that is something to consider. And also, again, some of those questions on the application are part of, you know, what we look for. So, you know, ACB is a grassroots organization. So things like volunteerism and advocacy, those things are, you know, core to our mission and what we do. So we are looking for that. Obviously, we understand that if you are in high school, you might not have as long of a, you know, a sheet of stuff that you've done, and that is okay. Um, we we understand that, and we we you know give credence to that and acknowledge that as we are reviewing the applications. Yeah, and as Rebecca said, some scholarships are based off of uh, geographical location. So hope your ears are perking up in Oregon and Pennsylvania. Um, if you are you know, looking into scholarships, check out acb.org slash scholarships, and you might be pleased with what you find. So Rebecca, as we have all these, these different uh, scholarship categories and just the, the breadth of subject matters that they cover, we're also joined today by two additional ACB scholarship awardees. So Mitchell, Mitchell Britwell and Amanda Lannon, how are you two doing today? Wonderful, thanks, Clark. Do you want to start or do you want me to? Well, I was just looking for a hello right there. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, but now, ladies first, Amanda, please introduce yourself, you know, where you're from, where you're going to school and uh, what you're studying or what ACB scholarship you received. 
Sure. So my name is Amanda Lannon, as Clark uh, introduced, and I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida. So um, I am currently a, an education major preparing new teachers to become special educators. So um, my undergraduate is in communications and in special education. I taught here in Orlando in our public school system for almost 15 years. And uh, then I returned to school to now to help new teachers uh, gain the, the knowledge and the skills and go out and um, start helping our students in the classroom. So that's what I'm doing now. Uh, as far as the scholarships, um, I received, and Rebecca can give the official name because I always mess it up. It is the Qualls. Um, Lloyd thanks. Qualls Memorial Scholarship. <laughs> Thank you. See, I knew the expert could get it right. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, I'm very honored to have received that from ACB twice, and it has been uh, a wonderful experience to be part of, of ACB. And, and as Rebecca was saying, a grassroots organization advocacy is, is important to me. And that's um, part of what, what I found wonderful about the scholarship is really becoming involved uh, with, with the organization and, and the efforts that, that they've put forth. So that's one of the great benefits to, to earning the scholarship be, beyond the actual scholarship. For sure. And Mitchell, how about you? Hello, everyone. My name is Mitchell Bridwell. I am uh, a s current sophomore at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, I am majoring in computer science right now. Um, I have not and with a focus in software engineering, which is my plan. My goal is to go into accessibility of some sort, uh, whether it be accessibility consultancy, um, accessibility from a development point of view, or just web accessibility in general. That is my goal with that. And uh, two years ago, I received, I believe it was called the Kelly Cannon uh, Scholarship for Computer Science. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what that was called. Got it. What the scholarship was, yeah. And who else do we know that went to uh, Purdue University? Well, me. I, uh, I went there for a while. Really? <laughs> I'm wait, from there, yeah. Wait, really? Yeah. Wow. Small world. <laughs> yeah. I'm and I work in the accessibility that. field, so we should talk. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I went uh, to Purdue for a couple of years. Podcast Networking 101. I yeah, that's it. right. It, it happened here first. Well, and that's the thing, though. Like, at the... Um, the con uh, the first convention that I went to, like there was so much networking going on. It was amazing. Like when I coming out of high school, I knew nothing in the sense of like how, and like I knew how to advocate for myself, but like I've never was never like a part of a, a go I had never gone to just a giant, like a convention sort of like this. And so it was huge uh, for me going out of high school and after these two years, oh my goodness, I can say it was worth it. <laughs> and how about you, Amanda? Did you have a, a similar experience attending an ACB convention? Well, actually the first um, national convention that I ever attended, so I've been involved with my local group uh, for many years, but uh, that my first national um, opportunity was in New York last year. And that was incredible. I mean, it was, it was literally amazing. I, from everything from the networking to just listening to um, the different programs and this and the speakers and just, just the opportunity to just be with other, other individuals with similar uh, goals and, and different goals, learning what else people are doing is just, fascinating so yeah i really uh that's that's a really wonderful opportunity is to get to know so many people from around the country and amanda you said that you were involved with your local acb affiliate and chapter is that how you found out about the scholarships yes definitely and how about you mitchell how did you find out about the acb scholarships lots of research online <laughs> during my <laughs> senior year that was basically the theme of my senior year 
uh, how I could get through it and, <laughs> and apply for as many scholarships as I could. Cause I did not, like, I knew I, I was, I knew the major I wanted to do, but I did not know what I was going to do with it and how to, how I was going to go about um, completing it. And so, yeah, I was just applying for as many scholarships as I could. I'm like, Oh, sure. This looks good. Um, I'm going to apply for this. And Rebecca, one thing we haven't touched on yet was the announcement from, geez, was it just last year, but about the partnership between the American Council of the Blind and the American Foundation for the Blind on the ACB scholarship program. Yes, we did establish a partnership where we help facilitate the, uh, the I guess, awarding of some scholars, a few scholarships that they have. Uh, um, and that has been just a, a really welcome addition to our program. And we work together uh, in terms of, you know, what that process looks like is it doesn't, again, it doesn't impact you from an applicant standpoint. Um, we, our committee facilitates, you know, the scoring and interviewing and selecting of those applicants, those candidates. And then um, we share that with uh, AFB uh, just you know, as sort of a, a final vetting process and, you know, hey, we've selected your, you know, the applicant, the, the recipients and alternates, et cetera. So yeah, it's been a great partnership uh, between between the two organizations and we're we're delighted to to have them on board in our as part of our scholarship program to be able to help, you know, help more uh, blind and visually impaired individuals with their um, academic pursuits. So they've been a great partner. And in some instances, this has meant uh, an increase in the number of available scholarships. And in other cases, it's meant you know, basically more money, yes. right? Higher dollar yes. value scholarships. Yes, it's allowed us to increase the value of some and it's also allowed us you know, to, you know, it's added a few more that we're able to award. So so again, it really has been a huge, you know, a huge addition to, to our program. And that really gets to the heart of the ACB mission, uh, especially increasing independence and economic opportunity for people who are blind and experiencing vision loss, right? Indeed. You know, I was I was lucky enough to come out of undergraduate with no with no student loans or debt. Um, I realize that that's a fortunate situation, but having these scholarships available can really put folks uh, not only on a, a level playing field, you know, but also help them avoid that financial burden of student loans hanging over them later in life. Absolutely. So. And back to Amanda and Mitchell. So Amanda, you mentioned that, oh, excuse me, it was Mitchell who mentioned, you know, you've advocated for yourself personally. Well, because we are an advocacy podcast, uh, share a little bit about that. How, how have you had to advocate for yourself? So the pandemic kind of hit like a truck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, okay, so, and um, last sem two semesters ago, before the pandemic started, um, the CS class that I was um, participating in was difficult more because of the um, the professor se uh, seemed unwilling to uh, understand the pr difficulties that I was having in the class and was uh, suggesting that I go look. Thing, uh, look things up when the lectures and the material that was given was not very descriptive and the office hours were very visual um, if that makes sense just because mm -hmm. everything is a very visual field and CS I'm very surprised about this I mean I shouldn't be but <laughs> it's it's super visual and so after COVID um, hit, um, everybody went home. And so how they had office hours structured was it was a first come first serve basis, but it was a one, uh, uh, one queue at a time. So you had to wait um, for basically as long as you could make it uh, to get into an office hour queue. And I kid you not, when I got into the office hour queue at the beginning of the office hour period allotted, I was usually like 10th in line. 
and that didn't always get me into the queue. So um, a lot of the time I was waiting for like eight hours to try and get help on things that just were difficult to understand. Um, and thankfully, uh, and now, and unfortunately that's not the only issue that I had with my, with the uh, CS classes, but I've had to advocate, uh, advocate and just talk to my, uh, access consultant and talk to the, uh, people at the disability resource center about all of these issues. And they've been very supportive of, of working with me. Um, and it's gotten better last semester was arguably worse because certain things the professor didn't realize that um i didn't have all the material until week 12 of 16 but afterwards this semester has been amazing and because i've just i feel like advocacy really does wonders when it comes to that stuff because yeah now i'm just i'm in some such a better a better position now when it comes uh, to that that's great i Rebecca, who knew that this would turn into uh, Advocacy 101 by Mitchell here, talking about... Uh, no, I don't know everything. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> finding allies, networking. Yeah, I love it. Well, Purdue has a tremendous um, you know, the tremendous Disability Resource Center and they other, really do. other they resources. Really do. So they, they you're really in a good do. spot. <laughs> yeah, no, like, yeah, Purdue, Purdue's Disability Resource Center is great. I the difficulty is seems to be on a professor by professor. Basis. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. That's always mm -hmm. the thing. Professor by professor, semester by semester. Indeed. Yeah, yeah evidently. Yeah. And Amanda, <laughs> how about you? How has uh, advocacy impacted your life? Well, so advocacy has been a huge part of my life. Uh, I would say my mom was definitely the uh, best teacher in advocacy. She um, definitely taught me to do what I want to do. And if uh, this plan is not helping me reach that goal, then it's not changing the goal, but it's changing the plan and how we're going to go about doing that. Um, and advocacy is, is key in, in orchestrating that plan and bringing, bringing your goal to fruition. And so she, she gave me a lot of guidance throughout my life and really set me up to be successful with that. As a teacher, I found it very frustrating at times because I did need to advocate for students with various disabilities and ensure that they're not only that they had the access, things were accessible, but the other component to advocacy that is equally as important is opportunities. Um, and ensuring that those students have equitable opportunities to participate and in whatever that is, whether that's a club or classes. Um, and ultimately that's why I decided to go back to UCF to get my doctorate uh, and in teacher education. So with preparing new teachers to go into the field, I'm really also working on helping them to be advocates for those students that, that they're now teaching. And, and advocacy, from my point of view, kind of has two levels. Um, certainly, you're going to advocate for yourself, but that advocacy is, is critical because it really is, um, you're advocating for not just what's good for you. Uh, so with what Mitchell was saying with the professors, um, that professor is going to better understand what to do next. So Mitchell's advocacy is having a direct impact on those professors who are going to uh, hopefully be able to improve as, as time moves forward. And, uh, and so my, uh, so looking at it, how, how it's benefiting you individually, but also how we're advocating to ensure that anyone coming um, beyond next in the, in, you know, in the class is going to have the same uh, or better opportunities than you had. So that's kind of where I am uh, with advocacy. I think um, I'm a big fan of universal design for learning and using um, those skills to, to set things up. We're never gonna be able to meet every single person's uh, exactly what they need. But if we shoot for uh, doing the best that we can do and being open to taking feedback and say, hey, you know, if this doesn't work, 
uh, what way would work for, for you and vice versa for me who might need that accessibility to come with not only like, hey, this is my problem, here's some ideas for a solution. So that's kind of that's kind of my take on on advocacy. That's awesome. I love it. So yeah, advocating for yourself can pay dividends for those who come after you. Uh, you can advocate for full system change to impact the the broader conversation and landscape. Man, that's that's a lot of good stuff here. And I, I'm curious. Uh, I'm sure Rebecca's familiar with it, but the, the organization Teach Access, talking about universal design, uh, but teaching accessibility to those who are providing, uh, you know, software and computer science educations for those same reasons that you were talking about, Amanda, in the education space, you know, providing that instruction so that those those individuals who are, will be in charge of molding the opportunities and the minds of the future uh, have access to the tools, materials, resources, and knowledge that they need to make a, a big impact on their students and what comes next. So, yep. Rebecca, in, I, I mean, a part of advocacy and self-advocacy is telling your story, sharing your story, and completing that scholarship application, right? Indeed. Yes, we do. We do ask a few questions um, in the application, two specific to advocacy. One is dealing with, you know, is asking about overall what kinds of advocacy efforts have you participated in um, and what was your role uh, in those activities? I mean, this could be, it doesn't have to be blindness specific. I mean, it could be any, any initiative. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, we ask, you know, what were the outcomes? What was your you know, role in those activities? And, and what did you learn from the experience? Those kinds of things. And then we have a separate question regarding self-advocacy. So kind of like what Mitchell was talking about. So we do kind of approach it from a couple different vantage points. Um, and we also have questions again, that speak to your, you know, your volunteer and extracurricular activities. Um, and any barriers or challenges you faced um, in your academic pursuits. For example, maybe you're a first generation college student. Maybe you have underlying health conditions that make it more difficult for you to you know, manage your schooling. Maybe you're, you know, if you're someone who's, you know, you're working, you're a, you know, single parent, you're a, you know, you're doing all these things. Um, you know, we want, we want to know your story. And I think, you know, this, the application is our first, you know, glimpse into, into who you are. Um, so, you know, make sure that, you know, as you're completing that, you know, spend a little time with those questions. Think about how you'd like to respond. You know, you could even type up your answers in a, you know, your narrative in, you know, Word and spell check it and then drop it in and making sure that it says what you want and presents how you'd like it to. Um, and again, because you have the opportunity to save your work in the application, you can always come back to it before you submit it as well. So, yes. Rebecca, every year there, there are folks who, uh, due to whatever circumstances, never come back and finish, right? Uh, yes, they're probably, yes, I believe there are. <laughs> yeah. I know but right now we have a lot in the system that are not finished. So I hope uh, if you're listening and you're one of those, make sure you, finished by February 15th. So that is a week from today at 11.59 Central Time PM. I, and hey, if you're on the East Coast, that's, that's an extra right. hour. That's Bonus that's hour. I like to hear. Yes. <laughs> so Mitchell, and I, I'll start with Mitchell. Mitchell, what advice would you give to folks who are either considering applying for an ACB scholarship or those who have their application uh, you know, 40, 50, 60% complete? Well, I, I would just first off do uh, finish it. That's, <laughs> I don't, you, I don't think you'll regret it. Um, but also be yourself. For me, that's, I feel like that helped me because I've always tried to be as honest about who I, like my, my experiences and my past and like my everything, like, 
I feel like just being yourself and telling people who you are is, and I know this is pretty cliche because everybody says this, but it's, it's true. Like, it's really true that like, don't like people want to know you. Just show them who you are. And that will definitely help. That's great advice. And uh, Amanda, any, any thoughts for folks who are either considering or have partially completed the ACB scholarship application? Well, at the risk that this might sound very teachery, <laughs> um, I would definitely say, uh, echoing uh, what Rebecca said, spell check, read what you've written, and just make sure that it it tells you, um, and then I'll echo Mitchell, it tells your story authentically, who you are and uh, what you're passionate about and what you wanna do with that, with that passion moving forward. Um, I, I, I would say that they're not looking for perfection, uh, but they are looking for someone who is has a has a goal or a mission and and they're ready to pursue that and how this scholarship is going to take you to that next level to accomplish whatever that that goal is you have in mind so if you haven't applied definitely go out there you can't turn something down that they haven't given you so um, there's nothing there's no negative or drawback to applying so you should you should always put yourself out there. And, and if anything, every time you put your name out there and communicate, you're building that network that you are gonna need later. So um, even if you don't get a scholarship, you'll definitely make some contacts and um, have, have a bigger network. So that's my advice. I like it. And as the great one, Wayne Gretzky said, uh, you know, he, he missed all of the shots that he never took to paraphrase there. So, you know, complete that scholarship application and then see what happens. You know, at least enjoy the process. Anything else, um, it's a learning experience. So, well, here we are towards the, the end of our podcast. So Rebecca, any closing thoughts or final information that our potential scholarship awardees need? Well, don't forget the deadline is next Monday evening at 11.59 Central. Uh, make sure that you have all of your documentation. So in addition to completing the application, we do uh, as part of that, you know, so in addition to just putting your responses in, uh, we do ask for a transcript. We ask for two letters of recommendation. Um, and if you are just transferring into a, a new university or you're you know, an entering freshman, uh, you know, make sure, or you're entering grad school, make sure you provide that proof of acceptance. Um, that doesn't have to be provided right away. You may not have it yet, and that's okay. You can, that's one you can follow up with um, later, but those letters of recommendation and um, the transcripts uh, are definitely required. Um, the other thing is, as you can imagine, those of us who are reviewing the applications are blind or low vision. So we do ask that when you are, when you can to provide all of that documentation in an accessible format. For example, taking a PDF and, and scanning it and putting it up there makes it a little tricky for us. And if we were to ask Nancy and Nancy to convert all of those files for you, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them, um, that would be uh, quite an undertaking for that team. So uh, when you can, uh, please provide that in, we do ask that you provide it in Word, preferably. Um, and in terms of the letters of recommendation, you can do that by asking your, the people who recommend you um, to, uh, you know, to provide those to you and you can upload them or you can, provide their information to the national office and they can you know, facilitate it that way. The other document that you will need, and I nearly forgot, which is probably one of the most important things, and that is um, a certification of legal blindness or like a, an eye report essentially from, your, from an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, or a physician. 
Uh, being legally blind is a requirement, is an eligibility requirement for all of our scholarships because we are the American Council of the Blind. So do make sure that you have that. That does not need to be in Microsoft Word. So please don't worry about that. We know that, you know, basically the office, is what, what Nancy and team will do is they will just go in and validate, you know, verify the information for us and, and let the committee know that that box is checked, right? So don't worry, it's not as important to have that um, document in an accessible format, but the letters of recommendation, we do, we do look at those. The transcripts we also look at. Um, so to whatever extent you're able, we would really appreciate it if you would help us out by making, uh, making those accessible. We know that, you know, like you, we encounter these same issues. So, um, you know, thank you in advance for that. But we're very, very excited. Um, again, you, you can't lose. You gotta, you know, you gotta put your foot out there, put your best foot forward, apply for those scholarships. We'd love to hear from you. We look forward to to the opportunity to, to meet you. Um, in addition to the financial assistance that you'll receive, um, it's a great opportunity to get to know a whole bunch of awesome people who are blind and visually impaired, just like yourself. And those opportunities are amazing. And, and the friendships that form in this organization and you know, ACB is like family um, to, to my family. And so, uh, you know, I would, there is a definite, there's a component there. So once you, if you are a recipient, um, you know, in a non-pandemic time, we would fly you to the conference and convention, you know, your expenses would be paid. Um, uh, but in these times, we'll have to settle for virtual, but there are plenty of opportunities, whether virtual or in person, to, to connect with the organization. And that's another huge, huge, huge win um, of this program. So, Get out there, get your documents together, and uh, get online and send in your stuff. We're looking forward to, to getting to know you. That's right, folks. We're getting down to crunch time here, especially with those documents that you have to produce and upload. Man, a, a week almost isn't enough time. And certainly, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, which will drop on Thursday, February 11th, and you are, you're cutting it close. And in fact, you're probably a lot like me, procrastinating and waiting to the last minute as a college student. So, it, you know, it does, sometimes it works. Sometimes you wish you started earlier and listen to Amanda and Rebecca uh, and all those others out there telling you to get stuff done early. So again, the Scholarship information is available on the ACB website at acb.org slash scholarships. And if you are watching this video right now, you will be able to find that link in the notes and comments with this video. If you're listening to the audio podcast, it's in the podcast description. While you are procrastinating on the acb.org website, um, why not also check out how to become a member at ACB or get to know your ACB family by joining an ACB community event. Geez, there was over 80 last week alone. So if you can't find something you enjoy there, uh, <laughs> I was about to say, uh, talk to Cindy Hollis, but uh, I think everyone will be able to find something that they're interested in and want to participate with on the ACB community events. And once you complete that scholarship application, you know, you're already on the website. Why not check out the ACB DC leadership meetings? Uh, registration for the leadership meetings is also open. That will be held virtually this year. Uh, geez, we've already had so, a great number of registrations for the leadership meetings and the links for how to participate, the agendas, our legislative imperatives, uh, newsflash community events this week and podcasts next week discussing the legislative imperative. They are posted on the website as well. So again, Rebecca, thank you so much for your time here today and the work of the ACB Scholarship Committee. Thank you. And Amanda and Mitchell, uh, congratulations to you both as scholarship awardees and Thank you for sharing your story with us today and encouraging those uh, young ACB leaders and students of tomorrow to complete their applications. So Amanda, thank you so much. And Mitchell, thank you so much. Bye.
Thank you for having me. And as always, folks, if you'd like to reach out to the advocacy team at the American Council of the Blind, you can email advocacy at acb.org. And as we always say, keep 